this uh, tragedy happens every day. And so um, we don't want to see anyone go missing, whether they're Indigenous or non-Indigenous. Tonight, some American truckers bring their anti-human trafficking message to a First Nation in Ontario. We believe that preventing future generations of domestic violence is about that healing and reconnection to culture. Plus, a shelter in Calgary tries to help Indigenous women on the run from domestic violence. Well, not everybody can afford, uh, you know, a $2,000 um, jingle dress. So I, I try to keep mine 500 and lower. And a woman from northern BC brings her one-of-a-kind powwow regalia to the masses. Good evening, welcome to APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. We begin in Ontario, where a small Ojibwe First Nation recently opened up a new business. It's on a busy corridor between Toronto and Sudbury, and on Saturday, they took the opportunity to educate people on the dangers of women and girls being trafficked. Here's Annette Francis with that story. This new eight-tier gas station is a great business venture for Shawanaga First Nation because it's located on Highway 69, north of Perry Sound. According to Chief Adam Paywis, over 10,000 vehicles pass by every day. That's why the Truckers Against Trafficking exhibit has been invited to spend the day. This uh, tragedy happens every day, and so um, we don't want to see anyone go missing, whether they're Indigenous or non-Indigenous. Uh, we don't want to see anyone get hurt, uh, and we also want to remind people that if you see something that's amiss, um, that it's, it's not a wrong move to pick up the phone and call somebody. The Freedom Truckers Mobile Unit is an American initiative that travels the United States, educating truckers on what to watch for. It's the first time the exhibit has come to Canada. Brandy Belton is the exhibit's project coordinator. She says its purpose is to show people to look out for red flags. If you might be in a rest area or a truck stop and you happen to see, you know, young children being unloaded out of a vehicle that are walking through a parking lot, knocking on windows or doors, or um, someone who looks like they may be malnourished or, you know, abused. Inside the walkthrough unit are stories of victims from across the United States. A tearful Christine King couldn't believe what she was reading. But the stories that are there, <laughs> they're just... Um, to see the age of these, these um, young girls, these young women, who um, were just girls and then became young women. At the age of 14 and 15, that's... <sighs> to see this mirror, to read that story that they were to practice, that's not what we practice, how to strip at 14 and 15. According to a report by the Native Women's Association, roughly 50% of trafficked victims are Indigenous women. Bridget Perrier was one of them. I was lured into based into the sex trade at the age of 12 from a child welfare run group home. Um, my uh, traffickers knew my weakness. Perrier is co-founder of Sex Trade 101, a survivor-led organization that educates the public and provides support for those still involved in prostitution. She says Canada has spent millions on the issues, yet exploited youth and women continue to fall through the cracks. You know, this is great, but what we need are exiting services tailored for First Nations women and girls. We have nothing. We don't need to put survivors are victims of human trafficking in a domestic violence shelter. We need our own safe house. We don't have it. We don't have a safe house that's tailored for youth. We, you know, it's just religious organizations that I cannot send our girls to. The Freedom Truckers Mobile Unit will head to Toronto for a few more shows before heading back to North Carolina later this week. But Belton hopes to bring it back to do more community events. And at Francis APTN National News, Shawanaga, First Nation. 
We want to hear what you think about the Truckers Against Trafficking exhibit. Here's how to continue the conversation. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca or leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. A women's shelter in Calgary says there is an overrepresentation of Indigenous people fleeing domestic violence in the city. They're working to combat those high numbers by providing a culturally safe space. Tamara Pimentel has this story. About 40% of the women who come here to the Discovery House in Calgary are Indigenous. But currently there isn't a space at this shelter where women can have access to their culture while fleeing domestic violence. And that's why the staff here is working to create just that. Where people can meet with our elders. Executive Director Leslie Hill says the overrepresentation of Indigenous people dealing with domestic violence stems from colonization and intergenerational trauma. We believe that preventing future generations of domestic violence is about that healing and reconnection to culture and and doing things in a way that's really, um, really partnering with our elders and, and having them lead the way towards that healing. Hill says the Discovery House will be working with Elder Pam Heavyhead to turn this computer lab into a teepee-shaped room filled with traditional medicines and Indigenous drums from around the world. The healing space will be accessible within six months to a year. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Calgary. According to some media reports, Pope Francis could be coming to Canada in July. On April 1st, the Pope told First Nations, Métis and Inuit delegates to the Vatican he would make the trip. Sources have been saying the Pope will likely come to Edmonton, Quebec City and Iqaluit. The Pope apologized to residential school survivors who made the historic pilgrimage to the Vatican for the role the Catholic Church played in the school system. Many of the survivors said they wanted Pope Francis to apologize on Canadian soil. In the meantime, the Manitoba Métis Federation has a delegation of about 50 people on their way to meet with Pope Francis at the Vatican this coming Thursday, April 21st. In a statement, MMF President David Chartrand said he will be asking the Pope to apologize in Canada in, quote, the heart of the national homeland of the Red River Métis and at the resting place of our past leader, Louis Riel. APTN has reached out to the MMF for more information. We have not heard back. The last papal visit to Canada was by Pope John Paul II in 2002. Now, neither the location or the timing of the Pope's potential visit has been confirmed by the Vatican. We will bring you more on this story as it develops. We need to take a short break, but coming up, the City of Ottawa is moving forward on a five-year reconciliation plan with the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. Welcome back to APTN National News. The City of Ottawa is moving forward on a five-year reconciliation plan with the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. That's been in the works since 2012. It will include the addition of a First Nations elder to advise City Council. APTN's Fraser Needham has more. And I'm pleased to recognize representatives of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. Last week, Ottawa City Council voted in favor of a reconciliation plan that will run from this year to 2026. Part of it is to have an elder sit on city council. Kitigan ZB Anishinaabeg Chief Dylan White Duck says it will be a major step forward. Although this this individual won't have a, a voting power or a, a vote, uh, and with you know regalities and all that stuff that has to be taken into consideration, um, this is still a very positive step to have someone that we could uh, uh, call and, 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 and ask, you know, what's going on in the city of Ottawa and for that vice versa. Algonquins of Piquanagan First Nation, Chief Wendy Jocko agrees that it builds upon the relationship between her First Nation and the city. I feel that Mayor Watson and his council clearly recognize the voice and the presence of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe Nation uh, in the city of Ottawa uh, and recognizing the Algonquins, as I mentioned, as the host nation. So um, the 
uh, appointment, uh, you know, of the uh, elder as the ex officio or a non-voting member uh, certainly is a great step forward. White Duck also says it means the Algonquin have a seat at the table when it comes to development projects. He says in the past, his First Nation has sometimes been kept in the dark, such as the proposed Taywin housing project southeast of the city. You know, there were some, some in my opinion, uh, some, some, some back deals that happened with the city of Ottawa and developers. And, you know, we were pushed to the sideline. And, but now that we have a voice and we have and someone that's going to be there to listen about all the ongoing stuff that's going to be happening within the city, um, we won't be blindsided by stuff like this anymore. City official Natalie Zaniga acknowledges it has taken a long time to put the reconciliation plan together. So the host nation put forward certain principles and certain commitments that we need um, to, to take into consideration in order to develop this relationship and, and this collaboration with them. And, uh, and, for, and, and for the city, it was important to hear and, and, and to follow these recommendations. The plan will also include the removal of indigenous themed mascots and symbols from non-indigenous city teams and the inclusion of Indigenous languages in city buildings. Fraser Needham, AP10 National News, Ottawa. The Sim First Nation signed a historic agreement with the B.C. Gov government last week. The Sim First Nation and the Ministry of Children and Families outlined how they will work together on child welfare practices. AP10's Lee Wilson has that story. The child welfare agreement, called Trois Sapmentum, translates to walking together. It was over two years in the making, and we'll make sure Simp First Nations laws, customs, and traditions are included in child welfare decisions. And it gives us, you know, we with a, the opportunity to voice um, our concerns and to have a voice in the planning for any type of protection. Um, again, like I said, the planning and then the placements of our, our Simp um, children. Simp Chief Shelley Loring and BC Child and Family Service leaders burn sage and ceremony as they signed the first ever co-created child welfare agreement. The First Nation says they will take measures to keep their families together and youth that are no longer in care will get reconnected. To reconnect them with our culture, our language and our teachings and the land, which is so important because we say that if you if you don't have that connection to your homelands, then you know you really are lost. And the same thing with our language and our culture. And again, this, this does set us on that path for those interim measures um, on us exercising our inherent right and our inherent jurisdiction. According to a press release, this agreement establishes a pathway for other Indigenous communities to develop their own policy with the B.C. government. Lee Wilson, APT National News, Kitimat. What happened to baby Tobias Suze at the Jim Pattison Children's Hospital in Saskatoon? That's the question the family of the seven-month-old boy wants answered after he suffered a broken leg in the hospital. APTN's Leanne Sanders has the story. Baby Tobias Suze was born prematurely last September 1st and has been in the hospital since. His mother, Tila Suze, says he was happy and doing well when she visited him on April 4th. When she returned to visit him a few days later, she found her baby in a full leg cast and the head nurse couldn't tell her what happened. And then when I walked in, his leg was covered up. I walked in and I uncovered him to, to pick him up just to find out he had a cast on, like a whole leg cast, and it scared me. Yeah, she just came in and told me that, in front of me that the, early that morning they took him for, they noticed his leg was, he was in pain because of his leg. And then they took him down for x-rays just to find out that his, like his femur bone was broken. And they told me it was a slight break. Now the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations is calling for a full, formal, independent investigation with an FSIN-appointed health official working alongside. FSIN Vice Chief David Pratt says they want to determine exactly what took place. This can't be covered up. Too often, uh, you know, we've been as First Nations people, we're dealing where incidents happen within the healthcare system as well as within the justice system, and they're swept under the rug. And people look at it, well, it's just another Indian, you know, it doesn't matter. Well, it does matter. A statement from the Saskatchewan Health Authority reads, 
We are very sorry to hear about the concerns being raised by this family and are working to ensure conversations with family and their supports, formal safety event processes and appropriate medical investigations are completed. It goes on to say reviews may include case conferences with the family and staff and a formal review process. Tila Suze just wants to know what happened to her baby. I asked how that happened. They said they don't know. They won't give me an answer. Leanne Sanders, APTN National News, Saskatoon. Communities along the Mackenzie River in the Northwest Territories are anxiously awaiting spring breakup. While it's uncertain whether residents will face similar flooding as seen in 2021, which required evacuations, efforts are being made to better prepare with emergency planning and supply management. This was the scene last year in Jean Marie River and Fort Simpson from flooding caused by ice jams, an annual occurrence which can be hard to predict. As May approaches, communities have been planning out possible scenarios, including evacuations, and have received supplies such as cots and blankets. The territorial government says water levels, snowfall and the late spring could put communities at risk of flooding. The GNWT has met um, with community governments and consulted with them on several occasions since the 2021 floods. And so we've addressed many of the issues that arose last year. Um, Part of this is uh, work is the Be Ready campaign intended to ensure that communities and residents are better prepared for potential flooding this spring. We need to step aside one final time, but coming up, there are hidden messages in this woman from Northern British Columbia's much sought after powwow regalia. It's a mother's hands and a baby, see the picture. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. Natalie Spence captured this photo near South Indian Lake, Manitoba. A great shot of a sun dog, or as she called it, a solar halo. It sure does appear divine. Great photo, Natalie. Thanks for sending that in. If you have a great photo, email it to share at aptn.ca, and it might be our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at Small's weather forecast. Starting over in the east, 6 degrees in Charlottetown and 6 in St. John's. 2 degrees in Happy Valley Goose Bay and 0 in Cartwright. 3 degrees in Rouen Noranda and 3 degrees in Montreal. 3 in Sault Ste. Marie and 5 in Sarnia. Clear and 6 in Big Trout Lake and 5 degrees in Thunder Bay. Minus 5 in a mix of sun and cloud in Churchill and plus 5 in God's Lake. 3 and some rain in Barron's River and 1 in light snow in Winnipeg. 0 degrees and some snow in Estevan and 2 in North Battleford. 5 degrees and some snow in La Ronge and minus 1 in clear in Uranium City. Over in the west, clear in minus 2 in Fort Chippewan and snow in plus 1 in Grand Prairie. Plus 2 in Edmonton and plus 11 in Medicine Hat. 11 degrees and some rain in Vancouver and 5 in clear in Quesnel. 6 in snow in Smithers and 3 degrees in Dees Lake. 1 in Whitehorse and minus 1 in Rock River. 2 in clear in Trout Lake and 1 in clear in Wrigley. Minus 6 in Fort McPherson and minus 5 in clear in Colville Lake. Minus 16 in Whale Cove and minus 14 in Baker Lake. For regalia makers across the nation, heart and soul goes into the outfits they design, and our next artist is no exception. Our reporter Charlotte Mark Jacobs takes us to Northeast British Columbia for this colorful profile. So that my skirts fit right under here. See, and I just Shirley Jagadets Harold is sharing her love of life one stitch at a time. For over 20 years, she's been designing traditional and contemporary one-of-a-kind creations. And, uh, the shoe shop people kind of like there were actually rock people. So the shoe shop Hungarian that. artist lives in the small community of Fort Nelson First Nation, Northeast British Columbia. 
It's here where she began sewing regalia for her family. But when word got around of her talents, the order started coming in. And then I went to sleep and I dreamt of this, this dress just flying like petals like this, like when you go around like this. And I thought, okay. So I thought of this and I made it on both sides and it's bias taped edges so that when it does open, you got a nice side. Her collection well, seems endless. I thought, hey, I like this pinking shears. It reminds me of my old grandma, the way my grandma Rose used to do it. While respecting tradition, she adds contemporary flair into her work. Lots of the ones that I do, they aren't traditional, but they can be turned into traditional. You can, like, what is it, 365 jingles you're supposed to have on there. You do a prayer for every jingle that's on your dress. With this dress here, I'm sure that, th that they would want to add more, and there's always room. I try to always make sure there's room that they can, I could even send them ribbon, and they can add it more. So it's just amazing, you know, I, I've made one for somebody that wanted one to be buried in, and, uh, and they like, there's just no words to explain making something that special for them. She takes orders from across the country. I decided I'm going to make my own little, little fabric corner. So this While there's no limit on creativity, there is on supplies in the remote corner of BC. So cute. And one of the hottest items to play with. This is a fabric panel. I love fabric panels. No two pieces are alike. And she includes hidden messages throughout. Take care of your baby. It's a mother's hands and a baby. See the and it isn't about the money. You know, not everybody can afford uh, you know, a $2,000 um, jingle dress. So I, I try to keep mine 500 and lower. Uh, but, I, you know, people will say, well, you're lowballing us or wherever you say that. I'm like, no, no, I, I want everybody, everybody to, to be able to afford a dress. For Jagged X Herald, it's all about being loud and proud in your culture. Oh, this is called moose, the Moose Hunter. You see, it's got and I actually take this cord here and I'll actually put rhinestones on it because I like rhinestones. I call them sun catchers. And it's all about, somebody told me, this is what I was told, it's all about the sun hitting it and glaring off of you and you getting the attention of the creator. And the more bling and stuff that you have going, the more he's going to see you. Charlotte Mark Jacobs, APTN National News, Fort Nelson, First Nation. After a two-year break for COVID, an annual dog team race as old as the territory is back for Nunavut. Started in 1999, the Nunavut Quest is a dog team race like no other, as mushers spend a week traveling between Arctic Bay and Glulik. This was the scene over the weekend as the 15 teams competed in a mini race to decide the starting order. They left Arctic Bay at around 3 o'clock Eastern today and will arrive in Glulik on April the 25th. This is authentic Inuit dog slitting. All the harnesses and whips are handmade, often by the racers themselves. The race had been run every year since 1998, but was canceled the last two years due to COVID restrictions. The, the winning team takes home $20,000. That's all we have for you tonight on APTN National News. For news anytime, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Daryl Stranger. Thank you for joining us. Have a great night.